Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and I have my good friend here, Adam co-hosting the show with me. Hey, Andy. How's it going, Adam? Doing well this week, my friend. So we want to continue our conversation on ransomware protection. One of the things that I saw on Twitter this week, there was a guy who tweeted out about security, and I want to mention this again because as we mention all of these different tools, we shouldn't let perfect stand in the way of good security. A lot of these products that we talk about can be bypassed, and many of them very easily by cyber criminals. But just because a product can be bypassed doesn't mean that it's worthless. Every bypass is an opportunity to get caught by something else. So in security, we talk about security as an onion or security in layers, defense in depth. Each tool that you have in place, each mitigation that you have in place is just something to make it harder for that cyber criminal who is trying to attack your environment to have to get past. So keep that in mind as we start talking about all these different tools that whatever you have, even if it's not the perfect tool or what someone recommends, doesn't mean that it's worthless. If you think of your security tools as almost a funnel where you're trying to chip away at the number of attacks that get to the next stage as you deploy more and more tools. So this is true of both. Think of email protection as well as endpoint protection, where our first kind of layer of protection is going to be signature-based detection for known attacks. And in almost all cases, you're going to say the majority of attacks today, I believe it's well over 95%, are zero-day, attacks we've never seen before because they're polymorphic or metamorphic. And that's true. However, if you're not blocking that other 95%, then you're just going to make more work for yourself. So there's still a need to kind of build that funnel of tools where this tool is going to block 90% of attacks, and this tool is going to catch the next 5%, and then this tool is going to get the next 3%. Each one of those is still helping focus your efforts on just the stuff that gets through. And if less stuff gets through, you can spend more time learning from it and mitigating it moving forward. Last week, we talked about endpoint protection specifically. Once you have an endpoint solution, whatever you decide with, the next logical step is an EDR solution or an ATP solution. There's a lot of industry terms, marketing terms that they use for these. But what that is, is essentially a solution that helps you monitor it. I think of endpoint protection as a fire and forget type solution where you deploy it out and it just does its job. There's no need to monitor it. If it comes across a signature-based attack or a heuristic attack that it knows of, it'll just stop it. And if it doesn't stop it, it gets through. And so that's your first layer of defense. The EDR solution is generally another SKU or another product that that endpoint protection company is going to add on or module to that solution. So in the case of Microsoft, it's Microsoft Defender ATP. I'm familiar with CrowdStrike as well. They have their own EDR solution. Semantic ATP is their add-on to Semantic Endpoint Protection or SEP. And so each one of these vendors will have this next solution that they will show you and say, hey, this is the new modern way of doing things. And the ATP or EDR solution is where I think the SOC analyst or incident response person spends the majority of their time looking at. It's where the alerts come in. It's where the investigation is. It also allows you to see a chain of attack. So if there's an alert that comes through, you can see Adam launched an executable on his machine, and that started a sequence of events that started to encrypt the contents of his hard drive. Or Adam sent this file to Andy, and Andy opened it up, and Adam opened it up, and both their computers started to become encrypted. And then it propagated to, say, some file shares. So in an EDR solution, you're able to see the propagation and lateral movement of an attack. You can also search for IOCs and hashes of different files that are malicious that are published, so threat hunting. And usually it allows you to take action as well, such as isolating an endpoint or removing that file from the machine or machines that are infected. The other thing for endpoint protection, you often think of that as a scanning tool, 
So it'll perform a scan at a certain time. I know SEP does this, Defender does this, and that can create some strain on the machine itself. There are some solutions that actually look for an executable versus scanning for that. So the idea would be if the file is sitting on the machine and it's an infected file, if it's not actually doing anything, then it's not actually harming anyone. As soon as it starts executing, that's when the endpoint protection will pick up and stop the action. Now that's a little risky because you're depending on your endpoint protection or EDR solution to really stop the action and detect that malicious action right away versus a scanning tool, which does put strain on your CPU and your machine and your users as it's doing the scanning. But it's a preemptive action where it scans it, sees it as a hash or something that matches close to an IOC indicator of compromise, and it'll remove that file before it executes. Two different schools of thought there. But the first one where it's actually stopping the behavior upon executing, that's kind of a new modern way of some endpoint protections in EDR solutions. Instead of just scanning and preemptively removing the file, they just wait for the file to execute. Some solutions, when you're, when you're talking about doing those scans versus waiting for it to execute, Scanning data at rest is is kind of a low value activity, I think, like you said, because if it's not executing, it, it's not necessarily harming you. And there's tremendous computational and, and disk resources needed to do that. So I, I think you've kind of seen a de-emphasis of that. I mean, obviously, a scanning solution should over time still scan the contents of the drive on a regular basis. But what you're seeing a lot of is, is that kind of block at first sight theory. And even built-in solutions like Microsoft Defender Antivirus will do this now where the, the device will attempt to render a verdict on the file on device. And if it can't make a decision, it will actually very quickly send it to the cloud and the cloud will help render that verdict. And all of that will happen in milliseconds, if not just regular seconds, really before the user notices anything's even awry because executables take a little time to launch anyway. So what's the big deal? So definitely, you know, agree with what you're saying, two schools of thought and and certainly, I think as we've modernized our tools, that periodic scan is becoming of diminished value as also known attacks are, are going away and, and so many attacks are attacks we've never seen before as well. But you need both. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the top where you have that funnel and you're trying to each stage you go through reduce so many attacks so you can focus on the ones that are truly relevant. So very important, you know, as we talked about last week, you want to have an endpoint protection, whether you use the default built-in Windows Defender or you go out and purchase something from a third-party vendor. And then the next step is to have this EDR solution, which often these vendors will sell you or, or try to upgrade you to. And it's definitely worth your value because this is where you're going to get all these alerts and be able to threat hunt and proactively take action if there is an attack. And then afterwards, take a look at how that attack happened and possibly repair or change a process to protect against it in the future. I think there's more innovation happening in this space than honestly almost any other part of the security space right now. It's still an area of tremendous innovation and tremendous competition where you have really, really strong competitors like Microsoft and CrowdStrike who make excellent products and are really rapidly evolving their products to continue to win over hearts and minds. And so it's a fun time to be in this space because we're seeing such rapid evolution and improvement. And it really is kind of the biggest paradigm shift to endpoint protection in the last 20, 25, 30 years. So it's kind of a fun time to be part of it. And, and certainly, I, I would agree with what you're saying, Andy, this is something folks need to get in on. I will point out one thing, though. So EDRs, you can run multiple of them on a device. Now, you might not want to do that for a long period of time, but if you need to do an evaluation of different solutions, in the short term, you can, because unlike antivirus solutions, which will completely step on each other's toes, EDR solutions, since they really just sit there and monitor in their default mode, they won't hurt anything because they're both just going to sit there and observe. And this gives you a real opportunity to look at different solutions and find the one that's right for you. On another note, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, the artist formerly known as Defender ATP, is built into the Windows 10 operating system as well. So there's there's some advantages there where, as we talked about in our previous show, antivirus solutions and EDR solutions as well have a tremendous amount of privilege. And having a product that ships as part of the operating system is, is certainly beneficial as well. So as you do your evaluation, certainly uh, Microsoft should probably be included in that evaluation. 
That's a really good point about ATP solutions or EDR solutions being able to run side by side with other products. Mm -hmm. Because I know for CrowdStrike, you could have the CrowdStrike agent, the AV agent on the machine that can feed into the EDR solution through CrowdStrike, use the EDR solution through CrowdStrike to take the enforcement and the actions, but I can still passively feed all those signals to Defender ATP and have the telemetry and the signal and the analysis within ATP just not have it do the enforcement of any actions. Like if I needed to isolate a machine and actually take action on a machine, I would do that through the CrowdStrike portal, but I still have all of that information in the Defender ATP portal. I don't think it's a solution you would want to do long term. Uh, I'd be concerned about performance impacts and and threat attack surface as as well. But but certainly, as you need to do an evaluation of the different products, it's certainly something you can do short term and won't have too much pain with doing that. So in the same breath of mentioning EDR solutions, because I know that from uh, Semantic ATP and CrowdStrike and with Windows Defender ATP combined with device control and Intune. One of the things that we've done in our company, and this is certainly something that if it fits your company and your defense strategy, is disabling USB or mass storage. Because one of the vectors for attack sometimes is to load a malicious file onto a USB, maybe do a USB drop, put the Excel file on there that says, 2020 employee salaries and someone finds it in the parking lot puts it into their machine and launches it and then it starts to encrypt their their data or provides a a foothold a command and control foothold on that machine to laterally move within the company it certainly is something that is very impactful for the user though so it's something that we did at our company and you have to be prepared for pushback from the users as well as manpower to Provide exceptions because with every control that you put in there, I guarantee you there's going to be an exception that has to come along that you have to add to a bypass list of some some sort. But it is a it is a very good control to have in place, knowing that any USB that you plug in can't launch any executables on the machines that you manage. It would also have data loss prevention benefits as well. Again, I think that's a pretty strong step. It might be appropriate in some scenarios, especially depending on how compliance bound you are as an organization, and certainly some are going to be more than others, but there are certainly other ways to accomplish a lot of that as well. I I don't think you can completely minimize the risk of malware being put on a flash drive, and it's definitely a real threat, but I also think if you're doing risk calculation probability analysis, as much as it's a theoretical, yeah, somebody could drop a USB in the parking lot and somebody will bring it inside and plug it in, I I still think it's pretty rare. And so I think the bigger concern is actually the data loss prevention piece more than the endpoint threat piece. And even with that, you know, if your DLP story isn't solid around preventing access to third-party cloud applications and, you know, you're plugging one hole in the ship while the water's leaking out of the other hole in the ship. So it's it's a really interesting choice. And, and I think, um, again, it can be appropriate for some organizations. But man, if you're thinking about it, I really encourage you to to think long and hard about it and make sure that if you are doing it, you know, you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's. Like Andy said, you have an exception process in place and everything else, and you're prepared for fairly tremendous user backlash. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is very routine, patching. Patching and vulnerability assessment program. The NotPetya attack, which I'll put some links in the show notes for how that attack happened, but it happened a few years ago. It took advantage of an SMB vulnerability and propagated from Ukraine and Russia across the world. And we actually got to see it in real time as it propagated across Europe and then into the East Coast of the United States and then all the way over, you know, through the country as time uh, passed. And it was a vulnerability that was patched, but a lot of companies hadn't gotten to that patch yet. This happens quite a bit where Microsoft will come out with a patch for vulnerability, something that was reported or disclosed responsibly, and companies just don't have a good way of patching or have a good vulnerability assessment program. I remember when I was working at a company when this happened, and the first thing we did was check our vulnerability assessment product which at the time was Nessus. There's a few third-party products out there, but Nessus was our scanner and we'd scan the different servers and endpoints to see what CVEs had not been patched, what applications had not been patched, and we 
checked for this one and fortunately we were patched i believe when we checked our machines we only had about 50 machines out of some six seven thousand machines that were not patched and we immediately identified those and did an emergency patch for them but a lot of companies don't have that process nailed down and i've even heard of some companies where Operations has said, we are a 24-7 operation. We can't have any downtime due to patching or maintenance. And I think that's just crazy. And in this day and age where information security is so important, there has to be a downtime for maintenance window. We know when the security patches are released for Windows, second Tuesday of every month, Patch Tuesday. You should have a control group that you release the patch to immediately, test the applications, and then usually by the third week, you should have the rest of the company patched. You know, Andy, this is something where people have spent a lot of time doing a lot of hand-wringing over the new Windows as a Service model. And thankfully, it actually solves a lot of these pain points that you're talking about, at least with regards to Windows client patching because there's no longer the option to do this piecemeal, this patch, that patch, this patch kind of thing. There's a cumulative update every month and you either install the cumulative update or you don't. And you can't kind of piecemeal it like organizations used to. Microsoft essentially took that control away from them. And that's honestly a great thing because really there's no, I shouldn't say there's no point to your organization individually managing every single patch, but that's just an effort that brings very little value. And it it was kind of born out of a sense of control that a lot of administrators have always kind of felt and just honestly wasn't necessary, wasn't valuable. So long story short, I guess where I'm going with this point is that although it is not the magic solution, you still need to patch for sure, it's at least better in Windows 10 than it was in the past because there's no not that option to do piecemeal patching here, there, everywhere. You either install the cumulative updates or you don't. And so that's a big improvement where not only are organizations better patched than they ever were before on their endpoints, but they're also much more consistently patched in the same state as Microsoft, for example, would test it. If you're on 1909 and you've installed all the cumulative updates, well, guess what? Your operating system looks the same as somebody sitting at Microsoft. How's their Windows 10 OS looking like? As opposed to in the past when every single organization had a different patchwork of which patches they had or hadn't hadn't installed, you created these millions, if not billions, of different permutations of patch status. And it was just a bear to manage. And And so anyhow, I guess the point I'm making is it's a lot better now than it was before. And then I want to also touch on another point you were talking about with regards to the necessity of having a patching window, even if you're a 24 by 7 by 365 shop, which a lot of places are. This goes back to a conversation we had last week around the ability to communicate risk to the business, to leadership, and have them understand it. And that's where... If they insist on this, they need to understand at a very strong level just how risky that is. And if they say, well, what would it cost us to be able to patch and stay operational? Well, now you're talking about a high availability scenario where you probably need a complete duplicate environment to fail over to or something like that. And of course, that's going to be very expensive. But if you can quantify in terms of risk what the risk of not doing it is, and there's the desire from the business to stay operational 24-7 then that's going to be something you're going to be able to justify funding for. And so that's where it all comes back to communication skills yet again. If you can effectively communicate that and effectively communicate the risks, then you should be able to get funding for it or your business is just assuming a hell of a lot of risk, which maybe that's what they want to do. And you mentioned cost too, because when you have an attack, a ransomware attack or any type of security attack, a lot of people will say, well, what's the cost? How much is that going to cost the company? And it's not just a monetary value. With ransomware, for sure, you can put a monetary value on the specific ransom that's being asked for to get back to normal. But if you read the article that I'm posting in the show notes from the engineer who worked at Maersk during this ransomware attack and what they had to go through, it was more than just the value of the ransomware. People, when they were trying to put this company back together, they lived, slept, ate in the office 24-7, and it went on for weeks and months for these people, and it affected people with their careers, their families, and you know what he wrote in there was a lot of people just see the headline that says, oh, another company was hacked or another company su- suffered from ransomware, but the fallout, 
the collateral fallout from that is staggering and it's just it costs more than just money it's it's people's times it's people's livelihoods and there's a reverberating effect from that that is not the direction i expected you to take that in and it perfectly ties into the point i was going to make which is and i was going to be a little contrarian here there's this general thought process that well if we get breached there's the reputational cost that costs X, there's going to be the hit to our stock price, which is going to be Y. And we can kind of guess what those would be. And that's the cost of a breach. And it's some crazy dollar amount. Honestly, we are so accustomed to it at this point. I think the reputational costs are nowhere near what they used to be. And that's kind of a sad thing because that fear has driven a lot of investment by a lot of enterprises and a lot of leadership teams in security. And I think that boogeyman is going away a little bit. But Andy, the point you just made is really, really valuable because we know that the security business, you mentioned this on the last couple of shows, A, is just tough mentally and physically to stay in because it can be very repetitive, very grinding. It's it's an unwinnable battle, all of those sorts of things. But when you layer in all of those negative impacts on top of it, it's it's really terrible. And keep in mind, This is an industry where we don't have enough talent as it is. If we could snap our fingers tomorrow and create thousands of new information security professionals, it probably still wouldn't be enough. And so that's that's really a cost that organizations can't bear is to risk losing their information security team because there's not a bunch of people sitting around waiting uh, to get snapped up for jobs, not even now during... Uh, the pandemic, information security professionals have, for the most part, and, and I know there are exceptions, have been fortunate to hold on to their jobs because it's such a in-demand industry. So, you know, I, I think some of that cost analysis of what's a breach going to cost has changed over the years. And there's still risks and they're still very, very high, but they might be different than they once were. And that's a really good example. I mean, we started this conversation because a hospital was breached or many hospitals were breached from ransomware, 400 hospitals across the United States and in the UK, where their computer systems were completely down. I think about all those physicians, nurses, primary care providers in those facilities running around trying to care for people's lives during a pandemic while using paper couriers and paper notes instead of their computerized notes and ordering labs via paper and having someone run it down to the lab to order a lab or a test and having that results run back. And in that time, that could be life or death. And patients that are getting redirected to other hospitals, transit time, people's lives have been lost. We, we know this. And so the cost of it is not just monetary at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not protecting for it, if you're not communicating these risks to leadership, it can be more than just monetary cost. And certainly if it's about enough breach, especially in ransomware cases, which we've been talking about this whole time, those become especially scary just because those can end a business's operations. They, They literally can't do anything. Maersk can't ship product. Their ships are stuck in the docks. That sort of thing it outweighs any reputational cost, any stock hit, any anything. If your business literally stops operating for a couple of days, stuff gets really bad really fast. Certainly, you need to have a good tempo on patching your servers, patching your endpoints. And we've kind of given you some tips on that. There are some third-party products like Nessus or Qualys that can do scans of your machines to see what vulnerabilities you have. And something that we didn't touch on um, at all are also vulnerabilities within applications that you have installed. So if you install a third-party browser like Chrome or Adobe Reader or other applications, there are vulnerabilities within those. And so having some sort of scanner that tells you not only the vulnerabilities of your operating system, but also the vulnerabilities of the applications that you have installed, that is extremely helpful to know where your vulnerabilities are and to get those patched. Like for applications, A lot of times, I would just recommend letting them patch on their own because many of them just do automatic updates. But sometimes, if you have an enterprise application that works with only a specific version of that, say, browser, like Chrome, then you can't upgrade to the next one. You have to test vigorously to make sure which version of Chrome works with that application. In those cases, I would almost recommend, unless it's a business-critical application, try to find something that works with the current version of that of Chrome or whatever application you're using. Because if I'm stuck 
on an old version of Chrome with some web app that is critical, that's a huge risk that I'm taking on as a company. So that application better be critical to the operations of the company. Otherwise, there's no point in having this vulnerability sitting out there. I can't think of any application that is more important to keep patched regularly than a web browser. They execute code, foreign code, unfamiliar code all day, every day. That's literally what they do. And I can't think of anything more important. That's why all browsers move to this incredibly rapid update cycle, with the exception of Safari. I'm looking in your direction for that very reason, because it's such a risk. And that's just honestly not an acceptable risk at this point. And again, use your communication skills, use your assessment skills, and communicate that risk to leadership because it's honestly not okay. And I know there's going to be exceptions. Believe me, I've lived through them. I have the scar tissue, but in general, there's no excuse not to patch your browser. If there is something that requires some sort of legacy browser, oh boy, do everything you can to try to limit it in some way, shape, or form. I mean, do something crazy like if you're executing that version, then it is locked down, so we'll only access that application. So thinking about patching browsers and the potential vulnerabilities in them if you don't patch them. Reminds me of one more point I wanted to make around threat and vulnerability management. And that is, Andy, you mentioned Nessus. And Nessus, you know, was kind of the Cadillac of this space for a long time, but it had always had its focus, at least historically, in network-based scans. And so when you can scan all of your servers, you know, that's still pretty valuable. But from an endpoint perspective, certainly less valuable than ever today when your endpoints aren't sitting on your network. So that's where an agent-based solution like a Qualys makes a lot more sense or You may not know this, but Microsoft Defender ATP, what's now known as Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, has threat and vulnerability management built right in. So that's another capability of that product beyond just EDR, but also TVM capability. If you don't already own something, or even if you own Qualys, it's worth taking a look at and seeing if that can meet your needs. And again, reduce the number of agents on your endpoint, which is such a benefit, again, from both a attack surface perspective, as well as just a performance perspective, making your endpoints run better with less interference, fewer agents is always a good thing. Before we wrap this up, I want to mention in the same breath as vulnerability assessment, our third-party penetration tests. We do one of these once a year at our company. It's something that I would recommend doing as well. There's a lot of companies out there that specialize in this, where they can either do what's called a blind test, where They don't know anything about your company. They just do some reconnaissance and you don't know when it's happening. Or you can do like a known pen test where they actually put a VPN device or something like that on your network and then they'll just sniff around and have an in already. I had mentioned the reports that we had gotten in the password episode where part of our pen testing they had captured different credentials. And this is something that's very valuable, reports that you can use to help identify where your vulnerabilities are. Some of these companies will actually do a social engineering test if you allow that, where they can call people up or befriend them on LinkedIn and see if they can try to find an in to tricking an employee to give up a credential or trick an employee to even let them in the door, like a physical on-site pen test where they try to actually gain physical access. Probably not something that they'll do nowadays with COVID. I know at our company, we're not letting anybody in without proper identification. But back in the day, you know, that was something that if you house servers on-prem, that's something that you would need to make sure that you have proper access to because if I can gain physical access to your servers, there's no need to go around and find vulnerabilities. I'll just go and plug right in. This is expensive, but it's worth it. This is really, really worth it because when I think of a lot of organizations I worked for in the past and their security posture, and I think of what a pen test could have uncovered, it would have been a lot, (laughs) unfortunately, and there would have been so many actionable points coming out of it. Any one of these organizations worth their salt is going to give you a really great report enumerating all of the things you can do to harden your environment. And there's no better way than this really happened. Somebody really did get in this way. Thankfully, they were on our side. And then the social engineering aspect, you know, what's interesting about that, and I don't want to make a long belabored point, but I saw a series of tweets on Twitter that were complaining about an organization doing a phishing test on their employees because, you know, COVID and it's been hard and all of these things are very, very true, but the need for information security doesn't go away. And so that's where I think we do have to balance empathy for our people, 
but also not lose sight of the fact that pandemic or not, the bad guys are still out there. And so maybe it's not a really nice thing to do where if a bunch of employees have been laid off or asked to take pay cuts or furloughs recently to tell them to click here to claim their bonus check or something, that that seems especially kind of mean that way is to mean. do it, not empathetic. <laughs> Who is but, doing but that? But it's still, <laughs> um, it, it was some sort of um, newspaper media organization. I don't remember which one. But anyhow, point is that I, I would still say the social engineering aspects are probably more important than ever. Maybe not trying to go gain physical access to the site, but hit people up on LinkedIn, try to befriend them, try to ask them questions and say, hey, you know, this is Jane from accounting. I got locked out. My device crashed. I can't get in to the VPN. Can you help me? Still a ton of value there. And and I think pen testing in general, I'm just really, really in favor of. And I know it's expensive, but I think, man, it's so worth it. And two final points here, whoever you pick for a vendor to do your pen testing, you know, make sure that they're not just doing a Nessa scan and giving you the print off of your vulnerabilities. I've had that in the past, and that is not what you pay a pen tester to do. You want them to give an actual report on your vulnerabilities as an organization, not just a Nessus report or a Qualys report. As well as you should change vendors every few times because if you stay with the same vendor for five, six years, eventually they're going to be like, oh, I know this company. I know what they do. So I'm just going to do the same thing as I did last year. So you should change vendors in this space because going to a new vendor has a fresh look, fresh set of eyes on your organization, and they won't go in with some preconceived notions of last year's report. So that's all the time we have this week. Thanks for listening this week. Leave us a voice message or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. We're always available. We always love your feedback. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.